the Back to Africa movement was bold, ambitious, and, to some, radical. Garvey called on people of African descent to return to the lands of their ancestors, where they could build a future free from the oppression and racism that had plagued them for centuries. His message resonated deeply with millions, especially those who had experienced the harsh realities of colonialism and segregation. Garvey's vision wasn't just about geography. It was about reclaiming identity, dignity, and pride. But Garvey's aspirations didn't stop there. He founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNEA, in 1914, a movement dedicated to promoting civil rights, economic independence, and the cultural upliftment of black people. The UNIA quickly grew into a global organization, with branches in the United States, the Caribbean, and beyond. At its peak, it boasted over a million members, all united under Garvey's banner of One God, One Aim, One Destiny. Through the UNIA, Garvey launched ambitious projects aimed at fostering black economic independence. The most famous of these was the Black Star Line, a shipping company intended to facilitate trade among black communities around the world and eventually transport people back to Africa. The Black Star Line symbolized Garvey's dream of a self-sufficient, empowered black diaspora, but it also became the source of his downfall. In 1923, Garvey was arrested and charged with mail fraud related to the Black Star Line. The trial was controversial, with many believing that Garvey was targeted because of his growing influence and his unapologetic stance on black empowerment. Despite his efforts to appeal, Garvey was sentenced to five years in prison. He served his time at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, a period that marked a turning point in his life. After his sentence was commuted by President Calvin Coolidge in 1927, Garvey was deported to Jamaica. But the man who returned home was not the same one who had left. Although he tried to reintegrate into Jamaican politics, even running for public office, his efforts were largely unsuccessful. Many of his followers lacked the proper voter qualifications, and his defeat marked the end of his political aspirations in Jamaica. Despite these setbacks, Marcus Garvey's impact was undeniable. His message of black pride and self-determination inspired future generations of leaders and activists, from Malcolm X to Nelson Mandela. Though he never saw his dream of a united Africa realized, Garvey's legacy lives on. In Jamaica, he is celebrated as a national hero, a man whose ideas helped ignite the flames of black nationalism and set the stage for the island's eventual independence. The story of Marcus Garvey is one of vision, struggle, and unwavering conviction. He faced tremendous obstacles, yet his ideas have endured, shaping the course of history and the identity of people across the African diaspora. Marcus Garvey's life was a testament to the power of belief and the strength of a unified people. His dream of a liberated black community may not have been fully realized in his lifetime, but his influence continues to ripple across the world. The seeds he planted have grown into movements, revolutions, and lasting change. The winds of change swept through colonial Jamaica in the 1930s, stirring a powerful wave of nationalist sentiment. Across the British West Indies, a deep sense of injustice took hold, fueled by the stark inequalities between the native population and the British colonial elite. The labor unrest that gripped the region from 1934 to 1939 was more than just a series of protests. It was the spark that ignited Jamaica's political awakening. As the people of Jamaica began to voice their frustrations, one man rose to capture their hopes and dreams, Alexander Bustamante. A white, native-born moneylender, Bustamante was an unlikely hero in the fight for Jamaican autonomy. Yet his passionate speeches and tireless advocacy for workers' rights struck a chord with the island's black youth and working class. Bustamante had a vision for Jamaica, one where power was shared more equally, and the island's future was in the hands of its people. In response to the growing unrest, Bustamante founded the Bustamante Industrial Trade Union, a powerful force that gave voice to the demands of Jamaican workers. He called for greater autonomy, fairer wages, and an end to the economic disparities that had long defined life under British rule. But his activism came at a cost. In September 1940, during a waterfront protest, colonial authorities arrested Bustamante, viewing him as a dangerous agitator. He spent nearly two years behind bars, a martyr in the eyes of many who admired his courage and conviction. While Bustamante was incarcerated, his influence continued to grow. 
the Bustamante Industrial Trade Union gained momentum, rallying more supporters to the cause. But Bustamante wasn't the only one shaping the future of Jamaican politics. His cousin, Norman Manley, was also emerging as a formidable leader. In 1938, Manley founded the People's National Party, or PNP, a democratic socialist movement that sought to unite the working class and advocate for greater social and economic justice. The PNP quickly became a force to be reckoned with, attracting intellectuals, laborers, and activists who believed in Manley's vision of a fairer Jamaica. Like Bustamante, Manley was deeply committed to the principles of self-governance and equality. But there was one key difference. While Bustamante was focused on economic reform and workers' rights, Manley's PNP was driven by a broader social agenda, one that included democratic socialism and the empowerment of the people. Initially, Bustamante and Manley were allies in the fight for Jamaican autonomy. In fact, Bustamante was a founding member of the PNP. But as the movement grew, so too did the ideological differences between the two cousins. By 1939, Bustamante had become increasingly uncomfortable with the PNP's socialist leanings, which he viewed as too radical. He made the difficult decision to part ways with the party, choosing instead to chart his own course. The rise of party politics in Jamaica was more than just a battle for power. It was a reflection of the deep-seated desire for change that had been building for generations. As the island moved closer to self-governance, the question of how that governance should be achieved became ever more pressing. And at the heart of this debate were Bustamante and Manley, two cousins, two visions, and one shared goal, a free and prosperous Jamaica. But the story of Jamaican politics is far from straightforward. As these two leaders forged their paths, they would encounter challenges, conflicts, and opportunities that would test their resolve and redefine their legacy. The seeds of change had been planted, but the journey to independence was just beginning. By the early 1940s, the political landscape in Jamaica was ripe for change. The island's people were demanding greater rights, more representation, and a voice in their own governance. Against this backdrop of rising nationalist sentiment, Alexander Bustamante made a bold move, one that would reshape the future of Jamaican politics. In July 1943, Bustamante officially launched the Jamaica Labor Party, or JLP, a political force that would quickly make its mark on the island's history. For Bustamante, the JLP was more than just a political party. It was the embodiment of his vision for Jamaica. But not everyone saw it that way. His opponents, particularly those aligned with Norman Manley's People's National Party, dismissed the JLP as nothing more than a political extension of the Bustamante Industrial Trade Union. They believed the party was a temporary creation, a tool for Bustamante to leverage his influence among the working class. But they were wrong. In the first major electoral test, the JLP proved its critics wrong in spectacular fashion. The party not only held its ground, but triumphed over the PNP, winning the election with an 18-point lead in the House of Representatives. This victory was more than just a political win. It was a clear message from the people of Jamaica. They were ready for change, and they believed that Bustamante and the JLP were the ones to deliver it. The JLP's victory set the stage for a new era in Jamaican governance. With their newfound mandate, Bustamante and his party quickly moved to enact sweeping reforms. In 1944, the JLP-led government introduced a new constitution that would forever change the political landscape of the island. At the heart of this constitution was a groundbreaking idea, universal adult suffrage. For the first time in Jamaica's history, every adult, regardless of wealth or social standing, would have the right to vote. This was a radical departure from the high voter eligibility standards that had been enforced by the British. Standards that had long excluded the majority of Jamaicans from participating in their own governance. The new constitution, which officially came into effect on November 20, 1944, did more than just expand voting rights. It established a bicameral legislature, dividing the government into two chambers, the House of Representatives and the Legislative Council. This structure was designed to ensure that no single entity could hold unchecked power, providing a system of checks and balances that would safeguard the island's democratic future. But the changes didn't stop there. The Constitution also created a new position, the Premier, who would serve as the head of government. This role, held by the leader of the majority party, was designed to steer the island's governance and lead the Executive Council, 
a body made up of 10 members of the legislature. Together, these leaders would chart the course for Jamaica's future, making decisions that would impact generations to come. With the implementation of this new constitution, Jamaica took a significant step towards self-governance. The island was no longer just a colony under British rule. It was becoming a nation with its own political identity, its own leaders, and its own path forward. The JLP's rise to power marked the beginning of this transformation, laying the groundwork for the struggles and triumphs that would follow. But the story of Jamaica's journey doesn't end here. The fight for true independence, equality, and self-determination would continue, driven by the ideals that Bustamante and his supporters had set in motion. The seeds of change had been planted, and the island was on the brink of a new era, one filled with promise, challenges, and the unyielding spirit of a people determined to be free. As the world emerged from the shadows of World War II, a powerful wave of change began to sweep across the globe. The age of empires was coming to an end, and the call for independence echoed from every corner of the British Empire. Jamaica, too, stood at the threshold of a new era, poised to transform from a crown colony into an independent nation. But this transformation was neither simple nor swift. It was a journey marked by political battles, bold leadership, and the relentless pursuit of self-determination. In the years following the war, the political landscape in Jamaica was dominated by two powerful forces, the People's National Party, PNP, and the Jamaica Labour Party, JLP. These two parties, led by Norman Manley and Alexander Bustamante respectively, would shape the island's path toward independence. Throughout the 1950s, the houses of the legislature saw power swing back and forth between these rivals, reflecting the island's growing political maturity and the fierce debates over its future. Norman Manley, a visionary leader and a founding figure of the PNP, played a pivotal role in accelerating Jamaica's journey toward independence. Elected chief minister in 1955, Manley was determined to see Jamaica govern itself. He pushed through a series of constitutional amendments that expanded the powers of the local government, laying the groundwork for greater self-rule. Under his leadership, a cabinet of ministers was established, each responsible for key areas of governance. And for the first time, Jamaica had a prime minister at the helm of this new cabinet. But Manley's ambitions extended beyond the borders of Jamaica. He envisioned a united Caribbean, one that could stand as a powerful, independent entity on the world stage. In pursuit of this dream, he led Jamaica into the West Indies Federation, a political union of 10 British colonial territories, including Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, and others. This was a bold experiment, one that had the potential to create a single, independent state out of these diverse islands. However, the reality of the Federation was far more complex. While Manley saw it as a stepping stone to full independence, many Jamaicans were skeptical. The idea of pooling sovereignty with other islands, each with its own unique identity and challenges, was met with resistance. The question of whether Jamaica should remain in the Federation became a defining issue of Manley's tenure as Premier. In 1961, the debate came to a head with a national referendum. The people of Jamaica were asked to decide their future, stay in the Federation or go their own way. The result was clear. Jamaicans voted overwhelmingly to withdraw from the Union, a decision that would set the stage for the island's final steps toward full independence. The West Indies Federation, unable to survive without its largest member, collapsed soon after. With Trinidad and Tobago following Jamaica's lead and exiting the Union, the collapse of the Federation marked the beginning of the end of colonial rule in Jamaica. In the wake of the referendum, Manley and his government moved quickly to secure Jamaica's independence. The transition from colony to nation was now inevitable, driven by the will of the people and the determination of its leaders. But the journey was far from over. The political battles, the challenges of nation building, and the quest for a truly independent identity would continue to shape Jamaica's destiny. As the island prepared to take its place among the nations of the world, the legacy of these years, the decisions made, the risks taken, would resonate for generations to come. Jamaica's path to independence was a complex and often tumultuous journey, marked by moments of triumph and tension alike. Yet through it all, the island's leaders and its people remained focused on the goal of self-governance and national pride. 
the foundation had been laid. The stage was set for Jamaica to finally step out from the shadow of colonialism and into the light of independence. The year was 1962, and the winds of change were sweeping across Jamaica. After years of political struggle, social movements, and the relentless drive for self-governance, the island was on the cusp of a monumental transformation. The election of that year would determine the future of the nation. And when the votes were counted, it was clear, Jamaica was ready to stand on its own. In the 1962 elections, the Jamaica Labour Party, JLP, led by Sir Alexander Bustamante, secured a decisive victory over the People's National Party, PNP. With this win, Bustamante ascended to the premiership in April, becoming the face of a new Jamaica. The momentum was unstoppable. On July 19, 1962, the British Parliament passed the Jamaica Independence Act, setting the stage for a historic moment. Independence Day was set for August 6, 1962, a day that would forever be etched in the hearts and minds of Jamaicans. As the sun rose on that August morning, a wave of emotion swept across the island. The Union Jack, the symbol of British colonial rule, was lowered for the last time. And in its place, the vibrant colors of the Jamaican flag were hoisted high. It was a moment of pride, a symbol of freedom, and the beginning of a new era. Princess Margaret, representing Queen Elizabeth II, officially opened the first session of the Parliament of Jamaica, marking the island's entry into the Commonwealth of Nations. With independence, Jamaica was finally free to chart its own course. The Cayman Islands, which had been a self-governing territory of Jamaica, reverted to direct British rule. Sir Alexander Bustamante, now the first Prime Minister of Jamaica, led the nation as it took its first steps as a sovereign state. Jamaica joined the Commonwealth, where it would maintain ties with other former British territories, united by a shared history and a commitment to mutual cooperation. The first decade of independence was marked by economic growth, as Jamaica's leaders focused on building a stable and prosperous nation. However, as has been the case throughout much of the island's history, the road was far from smooth. Class inequality, a legacy of the colonial era, continued to plague the nation. By the 1970s, the global economy began to deteriorate, and Jamaica felt the impact. The PNP, under the leadership of Michael Manley, son of Norman Manley, returned to power after the 1972 elections promising to address these deep-seated issues. But the challenges were immense. Uncertain economic conditions and rising social tensions troubled the country well into the 1980s. Michael Manley, who became the fourth Prime Minister of Jamaica, was a pivotal figure during this time. He led the PNP, which remained one of the two dominant political forces in the country. Under his leadership, the party continued to fight for the ideals that had shaped Jamaica's path to independence but the struggles of nation-building were far from over. As Jamaica moved forward, the legacy of colonialism remained a complex and often contentious topic. While independence is widely celebrated, it has also sparked debate among Jamaicans. In a 2011 survey, approximately 60% of respondents expressed the belief that the country might have been better off if it had remained under British rule. This sentiment is rooted in years of social and fiscal mismanagement which have left many wondering if the promises of independence have truly been fulfilled. The question of whether independence has lived up to its expectations is one that continues to resonate in Jamaica today. It is a reminder that the struggle for freedom is ongoing, that true independence is not just about the lowering of one flag and the raising of another, but about building a society where all citizens can thrive, free from the inequalities and injustices of the past. As we reflect on Jamaica's journey, it's clear that the story of independence is far from complete. It's a story of hope, resilience, and the unyielding spirit of a people determined to shape their own destiny. But it's also a story that calls for introspection about the challenges that remain, the lessons learned, and the path forward. Jamaica's independence is a testament to the power of self-determination and the belief in a better future. But as we move forward, we must continue to ask ourselves, how can we build on the legacy of independence to create a nation that truly reflects the dreams of those who fought for it? How can we ensure that the sacrifices of the past lead to a brighter, more equitable future for all Jamaicans? The journey of independence doesn't end with a single moment in history. It's an ongoing process, one that requires the participation and commitment of every citizen. So, 
I encourage you to engage with this story, reflect on its significance, and consider how you can contribute to the future of Jamaica. Whether through dialogue, activism, or simply staying informed, each of us has a role to play in shaping the next chapter of this nation's history. If you found this journey through Jamaica's history compelling, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video. And let us know in the comments, what are your thoughts on Jamaica's independence? Do you believe the country has lived up to its potential? Or is there still work to be done? We'd love to hear your perspective. Thank you for joining us on this exploration of Jamaica's road to independence. The story of this island nation is one of struggle and triumph, and it's a story that continues to unfold with each passing day. Until next time, keep questioning, keep learning, and keep the spirit of independence alive.